important day. Good afternoon, evening, whatever it is, and welcome. We are in Isaiah. Can you believe it? Now, I know it's kind of weird because we're in the Hebrew order, so Isaiah in some ways comes sooner than it does in, in if we were reading the English order. Um, what's that? What was that, Patty? Right, would normally come after kings, and, and then we've already skipped Ruth. And, and so the order is much different. But remember, the section of the Hebrew Bible we're in is the prophets. Um, as we said last week, we finished the first half of the Hebrew Bible with kings. And the first half, Genesis to Kings, is sort of a, a story. It's a historical account from creation to uh, the exile of, of the nation of the southern nation of Judah. Um, and so we have kind of a, a continuity there. And now we're going to step out of that story. That story won't pick up until much later when we get to things like Daniel or Ezra and Nehemiah and, and those folks which is in the writings, the last section. Um, so tonight we're continuing in the prophets. We said uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings were considered prophets, though they're largely historical. When we're into Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12, we're into the more typically the group we think of as the prophets. Um, we call them the major prophets and the minor prophets, um, in the Hebrew Bible, remember, it's former prophets, what we've done already, and these are the latter prophets, partly because most of their ministry happens later. Um, let's talk a little bit about prophecy, and I will apologize again. This chart, you probably can't read anything on it. It looked really nice on my computer screen when I formatted it. Um, it does not look great. And again, if you're online, you can pull up the, the link that'll have, you can get this on your screen if that would be easier. So... We've gotten in small there. What's that? Small there. It's small there too, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so we, we kind of hinted at last week the, the pre-classical and the classical prophets. But I found this other chart that, that adds a third, which is, um, I know you can't read it, but it's pre-monarchy, pre-classical, and classical. Where we are starting tonight are the classical, or sometimes called the writing prophets. Nope, the, the ones before here. Outside of you could say Moses weren't really writing. So let's let's talk about sort of the different way prophets work across the history of Israel. The, the pre-monarchy prophets, um, and the key examples we have over here are Moses and Deborah. If you remember, Moses in Deuteronomy says there's a prophet like Moses coming, which is a hint at, at the Messiah a little bit. So Moses has his leadership coming out of his prophetic office that he hears from God, right? Directly from God and conveys it to the people. But, but these pre-monarchy prophets are leaders. They're not just speaking. I mean, certainly Moses is saying a lot to the people. They're not just advising or doing things. They're actually leading the people. The other one mentioned here, Deborah, it's mentioned in Judges. She was a prophet as her story opens and Barak comes to her uh, in the situation. And so the, as leaders, these pre-monarchy prophets are dealing with the people. They're talking to the people of Israel. So they're giving them guidance and spiritual oversight about, about what's going to happen. We can certainly see that Moses being kind of the, the largest section of that that we can see. And then we have a transition when we get to Samuel to what we call the pre-classical prophets. Now, Samuel introduces a monarchy. Early in his prophetic ministry, there is no king, but he's the king maker. He's the anointer of the first king. Um, and so with this section of prophets, these pre-classical, not writing outside of Samuel, you know, we have a book named after him. They become not leaders, but advisors to the leader. Um, we see that Nathan, uh, very specific to David, right? He's going to say to him, thou art the man in that that uh, sort of confrontation about David's sin, or Elijah and Elisha, we talked about a little bit last week. They had specific relationship to a monarch, and their message was primarily directed at the king and the, the leading class, the ruling class. And so sometimes it was military advice, or, or often 
going back to Deuteronomy, the, the rebuke or blessing based upon their faithfulness to covenant. Now, when we get into these classical prophets, uh, we have another shift. Um, they are, the audience, first of all, shifts. They're not advisors specifically to kings, although they, they sometimes function that way, and we'll see that tonight. But their message is to the larger community of Israel. They're the shift from people as leader. Now they're not leader. They're the mouthpiece, thus saith the Lord, but their message is largely given to the people. And it's talking about all of these things, that, that what's going on in society, where are issues of, of injustice, where are issues of idolatry, where are issues of lack of faithfulness to the covenant and speaking words of, of warning or even I even say cursing for the unfaithfulness to the covenant, but the good news is all of them will see have it the have this also this idea that that there will be a restoration that God's gonna he, God's gonna maintain His promise, and we saw that promise particularly to David that the Davidic covenant that He will restore even though there will be captivity or destruction or exile. We're gonna see that in Isaiah tonight, um, and so we have all of these different stages of prophetic ministry. All of them hear from God, communicate to the people, but how we uh, relate to them is, is a little bit different. We hear, like we said last week, from these guys, we get stories about them. Here in the writing prophets, we get words from them, oracles uh, that they get from God to deliver to the people. So, so a little bit of shift over the course of Israel's history and how the prophet works. Um, second thing, just kind of an introduction to prophets is the different types of prophetic oracles. There are probably lots of ways they can be categorized. This is one that I think is helpful for me as I think about it. Um, four different types of oracles or prophecies. Indictment. We know what an indictment is, right? Like at a court, you've done something wrong. Here's the charge against you. A judgment, an oracle that says you're going to be punished. The indictment says this is what you did wrong. The judgment says here's why you're going to, how you're going to be punished. Instruction. And this would be more you you have done something, but you need to you need to get something right. You, and in some ways, these build upon each other. The indictment precedes the judgment. After judgment comes instruction about how to be restored. And then uh, this, this category was called the aftermath. This is the, hey, there's been judgment, but if you follow the instruction, God will restore, God will heal, God will bring about deliverance for you. Um, and so here's, uh, we, we've got these two columns that are also helpful. We've got in the history of Israel, up to this point, we've got the monarchy, the divided kingdom. Now we're, we're bumping up against exile, first for the northern kingdom to Assyria, then the southern kingdom to Babylon. So before the exile and after the exile, there's a little different sense to the prophetic ministry. For instance, the indictment before the exile, what are they going to say? Idolatry is going to be huge, right? Uh, the high places and the bales and all that. The falling prey to ritualism, uh, your sacrifices I hate. And sometimes the promises would say that, that these things that they're supposed to do, uh, social justice, just in general, the covenant instructions about how you're supposed to care for people, that you're not keeping them. There's much to say about um, not looking out for the poor, not looking out for the foreigner or the widow, that, that are, is an indictment against the people that leads to the judgment. Now, during the exile, the indictment is, okay, you have less control, less agency because you're in exile. Somebody else is your boss. You're not in charge of things. So you, you need to make sure that in this exile, you learn your lesson and turn back to the Lord. And the indictment is you're not. You're, 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 you're having a happy captivity. You're content to be far from God and to be in exile. You're not returning to him. And so that would be the indictment from the exilic point of view. The judgment, um, certainly pre-exilic, the judgment's going to focus on something's going to happen soon. Uh, there'll be some political or military conquest that's going to be carried out. We saw it throughout the book of Judges, that cycle that went in Judges. They, they got away from the Lord, got set 
an oppressor for them until they cried out to him and then he delivered them. Same thing. Now, this is going to be a little more serious as larger nations, uh, as, a, as a nation of Israel, they're larger. And so the, the force that will be used against them is going to be larger. And then after the exile, um, these judgment ideas look at the, the fact that they're under punishment. It, it's, a, it's a restatement of the fact that what you're going through right now is a punishment. This is the judgment. This is, it's coming. This is, it's here. You don't want any more of it. Get right. Which brings us to instruction. Um, usually before the exile, there's not much, we don't see a lot of instruction because it, it's more about, you know what to do. You've got the law. You've got the Torah. Um, you're being wicked. There's, there's not much to say. Now that we're in the exile, the instruction is, how do you act in this situation? How are you going to respond? Um, think about one that comes to mind, though, he's not in the prophetic part of the Hebrew Bible, but Daniel, right? He refuses to, to eat the food from the king's table because it would be not according to the dietary laws he would be used to. And the instruction would be, uh, we're going to, he, he kind of makes a challenge. He does it and it comes out okay. So the idea is, um, how are you going to redress the problem you're in? And then the aftermath, um, even before their exile, even with the threat of judgment, there's always this note of hope. Look, you're still God's people. God still made his promise. He's not going to leave you. There'll be judgment, but, but after it, God's going to restore. When we get to the exile, it sort of stretches out a little bit more. This idea of the aftermath looks further and further ahead. This is what we'll see uh, a little bit in Isaiah. Um, we'll get to some passages that are very messianic that we looked at around Christmas. Um, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This shall be a sign. The virgin will be with child. And, you know, these are just before the exilic period, but, but we know the, the scope of those is way up. The, there's, a, there's an already fulfillment in the particular time period, but the ultimate scope is looking way far ahead. And that's the other dynamic about all of these prophetic oracles is as we read them, we have to balance between there's something happening in the contemporary historical context that that oracle is addressed to. There's something going on. But see, we, we have this unique perspective, and particularly that one I just quoted, uh, uh, this will be a sign to you. The virgin will be with child and, and she will give birth and, you know, and you'll call his name Emmanuel. We, we, when we hear that, what do we think? Jesus. Christmas Jesus. That's Isaiah chapter seven. That's 700 years before Christ. And it had something to do with what's happening in the days of Ahaz as the king that, that he says, I don't want a sign from God to show he's with me. And Isaiah says, no, no, God's going to give you one anyway. So there's something about that that's going on. And then the beauty we have from the New Testament is it shows us this long-term this eventual messianic hope that's fulfilled. And so there's this tension throughout the prophetic literature of the already and the not yet. What's already, and that, that's sort of in the immediate context, the people that heard, hear this would see things happen and say, oh, this is what the prophet was speaking of. But we know it's not just that. There's a lot more to the story way out here. By some of it, not even yet fulfilled. We we're still waiting for it. So the prophetic ministry and oracles are rather unique. So let's get specifically to Isaiah. Nothing exciting about the name. The book says Say there. Your free credit source on credit card lab. Not what? the fake free. <laughs> Excuse us. Commercial break. <laughs> the, the book, the, the Hebrew word for books, the fair, and Isaiah, that's his name in Hebrew. Uh, so nothing revolutionary, nothing unusual. This is it. Uh, and then the key passage, I put Isaiah 6, because that's pretty important. I think I just spelled Isaiah wrong. No, but actually, in Isaiah, you probably could name a bunch of pretty important passages. Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 53, right? I mean, all, there's so much in this book that would be significant. 
And, and mo most of those that I've just quoted are where? They're um, messianic. And that's why they become so important from our perspective. Uh, we'll look at Isaiah 6. We looked at it a few weeks ago, so we won't dwell too much on, on the Sunday morning. But, but that's the call of Isaiah. Um, I don't know what's next. So an overview in general, in broad strokes, very broad strokes. Um, the first six chapters, chapters one through five, kind of set the stage for, for what's happening. And then chapter six, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord as the call of Isaiah to the prophetic ministry. And then chapters 7 through 39 deal with the conflicts with Assyria. We'll look at those a little bit later, particularly two kings that are at issue, Ahaz and Hezekiah, and how they have different interactions when the threat of Assyria is knocking on Judah's door. Um, and then the, the next section, chapter 40 through 55, uh, generally point to what's happening, what's going to happen while Israel is in exile, while Judah is in exile. Um, uh, Isaiah, by the way, writes to the southern kingdom. Um, he's a prophet to the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, though his, certainly there's an interconnectedness among all of Israel. Um, so these oracles are about the time of exile. And then the last 10 or 11 chapters point to post-exilic time. Now, because of this, there's some interesting things in here. One of them is, uh, I forget which section, I believe it's one or the other, they, they point specifically by name to Cyrus. And so when we look at Isaiah, there's a lot of question about, is this a coherent work? There are some that see this book of Isaiah as three separate books, first Isaiah, second Isaiah, and third Isaiah written at three different period of times. This largely attributed to the prophet Isaiah, these considered later. Um, personally, I don't subscribe to that theory. I think it's a scholarly way of looking at it. Uh, it discounts the fact that a prophet, in this case, could have such accurate information or, or insight into exile or post-exilic times. The only way that could be that accurate is if it was written after the fact. Um, and then there's a little, at some point, the stylistic changes and other things. Uh, but, but we see other reasons, and I won't go into all of that because that can get tedious at times, why this, this should be considered a coherent work, not uh, an amalgam of three different oracles over hundreds of years put together reflecting it. Um, part of that is just we would suggest, we would agree that God has the insight into the future. And that's why he sent prophets, because he knows what's happening. Um, one, one writer says that, that prophecy is like God's syllabus. You know, we think of prophecy as predicting and fulfillment. Um, but, you know, that while that can be one way to look at it, the, the idea that, that you think of it about God's syllabus, what's a professor give you when you go to a class? He gives you the syllabus. It's not predicting what's going to happen. The professor saying, this is what I'm going to cause to happen over the course of our class together. And this is how we're going to handle it. In some ways, prophecy is like that. God's giving us his, his syllabus. Here's the, here's the plan. I'm revealing, my, I'm revealing something about myself that's going to be worked out in history and I'm giving you insight into it ahead of time so that if we went back to those different kinds of oracles, you know how to respond, either to avoid judgment or to bring repentance to restore the blessing. Again, it's that whole Deuteronomistic idea of blessings and cursings. And, and like we looked at Deuteronomy 28, one column of blessings, three columns of curses. It's like God knew um, that, that we, we would mess up more than we get it right. And so that's, that's general. So let's get a little more specific and talk about Isaiah. These are breaking it down. So one through six in general, um, I said overture and commissioning. Now I didn't put my slides in the right order. So I'm going to have to jump ahead and you're going to see things you're not supposed to. <laughs> Just kidding. So Isaiah chapter one, verses two and three. Hear me, you heavens, listen earth. For the Lord has spoken. That's the thus saith the Lord. This is the, the prophet hearing from God. 
I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donker, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Happy Isaiah, everybody. <laughs> this is the second and third verse of Isaiah. Isaiah's um, coming in. We'll go back to this. His ministry is roughly from 740 uh, on down to Hezekiah's reign. These are the three main, actually, not so much here. Largely, Ahaz and Hezekiah are the kings uh, in the line of David that he will deal with. Um, Hezekiah, a big reformer, and a, an important part of that. Um, and so he's coming in. But, but if we were looking, uh, 722, just to remember from last week, is when the northern kingdom falls. So sometime in Isaiah's ministry, Assyria invades and takes away Israel. He continues to minister. 586, 587 is when the southern kingdom falls. So he's pushing close. The northern kingdom has some problems and is gone. He's ministering not quite at the fall of the southern kingdom, but, but we're getting there within a hundred years of Hezekiah. We will get there. And so he starts this book, one of these first oracles with, with God speaking and saying, my children have rebelled against me. They don't know. They don't understand. And then a few verses later, I think it's in verse 10, he goes so far as to equate Israel to who? Sodom and Gomorrah. This is not a flattering comparison. Hear the word of the word, Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. I mean, so, so we have a, a harsh opening. This introductory, you would think, well, this kind of sets the tone. But in this overture to the book of Isaiah, a few chapters later, we get to Isaiah chapter 5. And Isaiah chapter 5 is a beautiful picture where God says, Israel is precious to him. I'm, I'm just going to read. That's just verse 7. I'll read the first few verses. It's hard to type them all in. I don't know if that's good or not. So I just went this way. I will sing. This is God speaking. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and he cleared it of stones and he planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judea, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its walls and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and the briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. And just to connect the dots, verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is what? The nation of Israel, the people of Judah. And notice this, all, all that harshness. They are the vines he delighted in. Um, we had uh, an orange grove, not the same as a vineyard. My grandfather had an orange grove growing up, and I loved working in the orange grove. One of the best things was when granddaddy had work. Now it was hard work. Sometimes I didn't love the hard part, but if granddaddy called and we could go work in the orange grove, I was all for it. Get the scuffle hoe and clean out the weeds under it. Um, when it was time to pick the oranges, to, to go up there, and he would always test it. I was his tester. He was, my granddaddy was my hero, so I could talk a lot about him. But he would pick an orange off, the original juice box, he'd take his pocket knife and he'd cut just the top out and he'd run his knife around and he'd squeeze it and that, you know, just right out, oh, it was the best. He's like, I'm like, yep, granddaddy, it's ready. We should call the harvesters. We should pick them. Um, one of the worst things is when the freezes would happen, and we would spend all night in the orange grove. We'd burn tires or, or, or who knows what, trying to keep them warm. And unfortunately, in the 70s, I think there was a freeze that pretty much wiped out the orange grove. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I could see that, that he, he bought this property, he moved his family to Central Florida, bought this property, planted this grove. He cared a lot about it. And this is, this is what God is saying. The, the vineyard is Israel, and God delights in it. You, you heard those early um, verses that, that he dug it up, he cleared it of stones, he planted it with the choicest vines. Um, 
Beth Moore wrote a book about this uh, chasing vines. I think some of you might have done the, the study that's particular to vineyards um, there. And so even more, there's particular things that would be highlighted there. So, so you've got this, but, but he says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty, it's the nation that I delighted in, but they turned from me, only getting bad grapes. By the way, I put this kind of at the bottom, compare John 10. What, what is John 10? Jesus, I am the true vine, and you are the branches. See, the, vine, the vine, the vineyard, and the understanding of the Old Testament is Israel. Jesus comes along and says, no, I am the fulfillment of this. That the, the, this vine that only bore bad fruit, what do you do to a vine? It tells us even in John 10, you, you, you cut it off, you trim it, you burn it. You leave, dare I say, a stump at times. And Jesus in John 10 uses this imagery to compare it to himself. And so he opens, uh, Isaiah opens his, his uh, book with these oracles that have sort of a, a, a harsh tone because God is coming out of his very delight in the people of Israel who, is turned, who have turned against him. And, and so oh, I don't want to get ahead of the thing. So that leads us right into chapter six. Here's the background, right? Israel is the vineyard. Israel has turned from God. Israel, Sodom and Gomorrah now. And so the vision Isaiah has, it's his call of, of God in the temple. I am in the year that King Uzziah died. Um, kind of a, a marker historically. I have a slide about that. We might back up and see it in a minute. The year that King Uzziah died. So we know kind of basically around when that happened. I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And, and, the, and the angels that are around him with six wings and two covered their faces and two covered their feet and with two they were flying. And they cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and, and the earth shook from, from their voices, and, and it's just this beautiful moment, and Isaiah sees God, and, and in seeing God, he responds, woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord, and, a, and the angel takes the, the coal from the altar and places it on the lips of, of Isaiah, and there he um purifies his sin. Okay, thank you, Roy. Um, he purifies his sin. And, and then God says, who shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, ooh, ooh, Mr. Cotta, Mr. Cotta, if you remember that show. Here I am, send me. He didn't actually say that, Mr. Cotta. Just for the record. And then God gives him his commission, and this is part of it. He said, go and tell this people. So what's the message of Isaiah? Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. What a weird commission. You would think... God, we want them to see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed, right? You would think that's what he would want, but he's saying that's not going to be the case in Isaiah's ministry. Now, the good news is no ministry, it seems like, in, in Scripture is without some fruit. Even Elijah, right? We heard him last week. I'm the only one left. Oh, Elijah, put your wine in there. 7,000 who've never bowed the knee. Um, so, so even though this is harsh, it uh, doesn't mean that Isaiah is not going to see positives along the way. He's going to see some things. There, there will be hints of positive things that happen. Let me look at my, my notes here and see what's next because I forget. Okay, i got to go backwards now. You ready? So, so that's the opening. All right, we'll go back to that. Here we go, the overture, as it were, and the commissioning. And then we come to the next section. Um, this outline calls it the Assyrian context scenario one. And, and if you look at the next slide, the Assyrian context scenario two. So what we have in section two and three are two crises that involve the nation of Assyria. Um, 
This first scenario happens under the, the rule of King Ahaz, so 735 to 715, um, and, and involves ultimately the destruction of the northern kingdom in 722. The second uh, scenario with Assyria happens under Hezekiah, which is a little later. Um, these two have different responses or different approaches to these Assyrian issues, and the response of God as well turns out to be different. So um, let's talk briefly. Now, now, most of the first context happens in chapters 7 through 12. So the next section, 7 through 12, is really about Ahaz and Assyria. Um, so so let's, what happens there? I wrote some notes down. So what is going to happen is the Assyrian king, and here, how's this for a name? Tiglath Pileazar III. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Invades the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, he also, so Israel needs help, and they call on Damascus, which is Damascus, Syria, but at that time was part of the kingdom of, of Aaron, and they come down into Judah. They think they need, Assyria is kind of, I didn't put a map up here, but you know, Israel is that coastal area. Syria is kind of coming over the top of the Sea of Galilee and down to get them. Damascus is up there. Maybe I should have put a map in there. And so Israel thinks if we, if we kind of go down a little bit and come against the southern kingdom and take some of their resources, we'll be better able to fight Assyria. This would be a direct threat to the Davidic monarchy, right? Ahaz and the line of David on the throne. And so Ahaz decides rather than fight this alone, he tries to side with Assyria. He tries to make a pact with Assyria to, to fight against the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Aaron, Aram, A-R-A-M, in Damascus. And, and in doing that, Assyria is very effective. Assyria is sort of the big bad nation on the scene at this point in time. Um, the, the late... What, 700, what were the dates again? Where's my clicker? There it is. Um, you know, this 735 to 7, 722 is when the kingdom falls. So he summons Assyria to help him. And in doing that, he demonstrates he's not trusting in God. He doesn't go to God for help. He doesn't trust the, the promise made to the monarchy. He wants to go get help from Assyria. And Isaiah is in his ear saying, bad idea. So chapter 7 through 12, a little bit of that is Isaiah in his ear saying, not such a great idea. Not the best plan. You shouldn't do this. You should trust God. Um, it, by the way, if you want the parallel passage, 2 Kings 16 talks about Ahaz's reign, just, just a bit, not a lot of detail about either one. And so Isaiah is saying, bad idea. God will be faithful to King David and the promise he made to him. Don't, don't trust Assyria. Don't trust a foreign power. It's only going to lead to trouble. But Ahaz does. Now, it kind of works out in that Assyria, being the biggest, baddest nation on the block, comes in and wipes out and takes into captivity Damascus and come down, comes down into Israel, not at this initial point but begins to make inroads into the northern kingdom of Israel that leads to the next step in 722 when they finally come in and carry all of the northern kingdom of Israel off. Um, and so Ahaz comes out okay. He's not taken into captivity. The threat against him is repelled, but he's demonstrated a lack of trust in God that, again, is that crack that, that we've already looked at. That you know, where, where did we go in the first few verses? Um, <clears throat> Israel does not know the donkey. No, the, the ox knows its master, the donkey, its owner's manger. But Israel doesn't know what's up. They'll trust in anything but God. My people do not understand. And so this is Ahaz fulfilling that actual reality in him. And so um, part of these oracles is the des description of that and. And, and God's judgment against that. Now, the good news is, while this is more directed at Ahaz and them, 
the next set of chapters, 13 through 23, God just tells everybody they're in trouble. So, so that you don't think, oh, these Assyrians that we allied with that come in and win, then God must be for them. This next 10 or 11 chapters, 13 through 23, God goes against Babylon, against Assyria, against the coastal nations. He just, you, can, you can read through the headings uh, in your Bible, or you can actually read all of them because that's always your homework, right? Read the story, read the text. Um, he just goes down the list. There's a little bit reserved for, for the people of Israel, but mostly it's all of these other nations. And this is important because while Ahaz messed up not trusting God, um, the, the constant undertone of the scriptures is when God uses foreign nations, that doesn't mean he's abandoned his covenant to Israel, and it doesn't mean he's in favor of them, and it certainly doesn't mean their gods are better than Israel's gods. We looked at that, right, with Dagon and, and the Philistines. Um, and then the next section, just briefly, uh, if you like apocalyptic literature, chapters 24 through 27 is your cup of tea. I'm not overly apocalyptic, not like Daniel or Revelation, symbolic apocalyptic, but this is uh, sort of that apocalyptic. Apocalyptic literature we'll talk about more later. There's much to say about that. We see a little bit of it in Ezekiel. We see a little bit of it in Daniel. We see some of it in Zechariah. Um, it's a particular kind, kind of literature that's heavy in symbolisms. The one that we from the New Testament know the most would be the book of Revelation. Heavy in symbol to point to ultimately God's victory. So again, so this would be, the point of apocalyptic literature is to bring hope to God's people in the midst of difficulty that God hasn't abandoned them yet. And so naturally with Assyria rising, taking part of, of the nation of Israel, the Northern Kingdom captive, uh, God wants to make sure his people know he hasn't forgotten them yet. So that's the first kind of little Assyrian problem. The next one comes during Hezekiah's time. And, and as you see, it starts out with the woe oracles. That's not good. I got my Jesus, right? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You can, you can read through chapters 28 through 33, um, and you'll see that, that they're the, the woe oracles. Why? Because Again, all that Israel has done, I, we've talked about the nations, but now we've got to deal with Israel not knowing its own manger, not knowing its own place, not trusting its own God, and that's going to bring woe upon them. And specifically, there's going to come this time of a siege while they were spared initially from um, Assyria. Assyria later comes and actually places siege on Jerusalem. And that's the, during Hezekiah's reign. That's the second crisis. And so these woe oracles are issued at that time. Now, now here's an interesting thing. Uh, chapters 36 through 38 are really the historical side. And if you go to 2 Kings 18, 19, and 20, you'll almost think you're reading the exact same verses. They're, they're almost the same. You know, you're reading the exact same story because they're, guess what? Telling the exact same story. You should have got that. So, so it's fascinating. So what happens is Hezekiah is the king, and the king of Assyria, now he's not tiglath Pileazar, it's Sennacherib, decides he wants to invade not just Israel, because he's already got them, he wants to come down and get Judah. He's got because you know that's the prize, <laughs> the, the, that city and some other trade routes. So he comes in about 701. He's going to do this. He, and so Israel needs to seek help again, they think, and, and they seek help from Egypt. That's what Hezekiah wants to do. But if I'm just going to turn over there real quick so you can see what's up. That's what Hezekiah wants to do. But of course, the prophet Isaiah would be less than thrilled with that idea and counsels him otherwise. In fact, if you look in Isaiah, you'll notice it's not in poetic sections. It's more narrative. There's a lot of narrative in these in these few um, these few sections, and so uh, Sennacherib is coming. It's a fascinating story. He has his, his, his besieged Jerusalem. He has the leader of his army begin to shout at the people who are sitting on the wall in a language they understand that Hezekiah is lying to them, and, and you can't trust him, and you should just go ahead and give up. It's sort of like psychological warfare uh, going on, um, and and so of course he's a little bit. Hezekiah is a little bit 
perturbed. People are listening. They're, you know, obviously the city is being besieged. They've done what they could with the water and other things to try to protect them. Uh, but Isaiah comes in and, and lets him know that, that Jerusalem will be delivered if they put their trust in God. And so that's what Hezekiah does. He prays. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings, verse 37, verse 18, have laid waste all these peoples in their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, Lord, are the only God. So there you go. He turns in faith to God. They are delivered. They are miraculously delivered from Sennacherib, the angel of the Lord, the end of verse or chapter 37, went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. So again, just like the book of, of Judges or Samuel, when there are these battles, or excuse me, Joshua, I should say, who's winning the battle? Is it the military might of Hezekiah? Is it his insight? No, it's God acting on behalf of his people. And so God comes to the rescue and Sennacherib and his people broke camp and withdrew. That, that would make sense, right? You'll go to sleep one night, the next morning, 185,000 are dead. It's like, yeah, I think we need to leave now. That's about enough. And they're out of there. And, and so there you go. Now, here's the, the negative. Good old Hezekiah, kind of proud of himself. He has an illness that he miraculously recovers from in the next chapter. And envoys from Babylon hear about their victory and come to pay respects to Hezekiah. And to Israel, you know what he does? He gives them the grand tour. He says, come on in. Let me show you. Let me show you my treasury. Let me show you the, the holy vessels. And Isaiah hears about him. And he says, what did they see? And, and Hezekiah says, they saw everything. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Chapter 39, verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Ouch. All because he had a little victory party. Um, so... You know, that's a warning to, to all of us, right? The, the very short distance between faith and pride. It's not a, it's not a long jump. When, when God is faithful to somehow forget it was about God and it becomes, yes, let me show you what, what we've amassed. And uh, Hezekiah, though, in his lifetime, that didn't happen. It wasn't long after that, about 100 years after him that went over. And so that's the end of chapter 39. That the next section, section three, projected oracles addressing the exiles. So chapter 40, if you were to read it, it begins, comfort, comfort my people from the Messiah. You might know that passage. Um, it begins with this shift in time frame that the, the, the actions of Hezekiah have opened the door for Babylon to see, hey, they're worth invading. They're worth taking over. And they do. And so this, the, the whole tone of the book in the next 15 or so chapters shifts to the fact that they are going to come back. They're going to take you into exile and you're going to need God's comfort. But in this section is this wonderful note of hope because a figure emerges in chapters 40 through 55 that you are familiar with. We often call him the servant, or more specifically, the suffering servant. Um, and so it's this section, while they're in exile, that these notes of hope continue to be expressed to the people of Israel. He first kind of shows up in chapter 42. We, we hear mention of this servant. In fact, the, 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 the section title in the NIV is servant of the Lord. Here is my servant who I, who I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. And it, it goes on and talks about this servant that God will raise up. Well, why is he going to raise up a servant? Because we've got the promise 
to David. So Isaiah is prophesying that, that while it looks bad, while you're, you're facing exile, which is certain, and, and the address is assuming you're in exile, God is not done, and he does keep his promises. A few chapters later, chapter 49 picks up that theme once again. The servant of the Lord, listen to me, you islands, hear me, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he spoke my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword, and the shadow of his hands, he hid me. And it goes on and talks about this. Verse 7, this is what the Lord says, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One in Israel, who has chosen you. Sounds good, right? He's going to come in and he's got a sword in his mouth. He's going to kick some serious butt. Am I allowed to say that in church? I guess I just did. But since we won't, God doesn't want us to get the wrong idea just a few chapters later. In the end of chapter 52, we're introduced to this servant from a different point of view. This servant becomes the suffering servant. Um, and, and later in chapter 52, verse 15, actually verse, verse 13, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. We know where, we know where that's going from. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. I love that phrase, sprinkle many nations. It's a liturgical phrase. Um, it comes right out of the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood using hyssop on the, on the mercy seat, on the, on the Ark of the Covenant. But notice here, it's not he's sprinkling. In that context, it was for the atonement of Israel. Here, it's for the atonement of the world. Many nations. We said this a lot lately. God's vision has always been for the world, not just for Israel, not just for us. And so he does that. And then chapter 53 is really kind of where we see that suffering servant motif. Verse four, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was trust, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I won't take the time to do it, but if you were to go to Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5, 6, and 7 in there, some of these things that are now laid on this suffering servant are the very ailments of the people of Israel that God predicted and said through Isaiah would be the reality. So the picture here is, is the sickness and the, the, the pain of Israel has been taken off of them and, and God is striking his servant with these things for them. What's this about, right? Not hard to figure out. It's about Jesus. It's about the fact that, that God would act in history Yes, to redeem, but not in the way we would expect, not in the way Israel might expect. This suffering servant idea is not what they wanted. You know, they wanted Saul. They wanted the king a head taller than anybody and, and impressive in stature and with all the right qualifications. And yet God sends them what they actually need, this suffering servant. You can see it in verse Verse, excuse me, chapter 54, it talks about the future glory of Zion and the invitation in chapter 55. Come, all you are thirsty, come to the waters. You have no money, come by and eat. The idea that, that this servant will restore everything. And so even in exile, God promises he'll raise up for them a deliverer. And that brings us to kind of the last section um, this is the post-exilic situation. This is this is looking, in some ways, way out in the future. Although you know we could say suffering servant, and some of the other places are looking pretty far out. But this particularly has kind of its underpinnings of great hope. And as we get almost to the end, chapter sixty-five, a few 
verses for you. Here we go. See, chapter 65, verse 17. God says, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. Where have you heard that before? Right? We, Revelation. And, and But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create a Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. And then verse 25, the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Almost to the end of, of this whole book, this prophetic book of Isaiah, we have this. I remember way back when we talked about Genesis, the very first messianic note of hope, Genesis 3.15, after the fall in the curse of the serpent, that there would be enmity between the serpent and the seed of the woman, and the serpent would strike his heel, but the seed of the woman would crush his head. And, and so we have, who, sh who shows up at the end of Isaiah? Serpent, what's he eating? He's not eating heels anymore. He's eating. He's been he's been neutered. He's powerless. The serpent. What's happened is the seed of the woman. This new heavens and new earth and this 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 suffering servant we talked about. The seed of the woman has finally triumphed. So that they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. God has come to the end of this tale and said, now the serpent is harmless and the battle is over. That's the promise. That Genesis 3.15, at the end of Isaiah, we see God pointing at a post-exilic. When does that mean? It could mean, well, way in the future. Certainly for them, they hope that this idea of Jerusalem and peace would be in their lifetime or in several generations. And it hasn't worked out yet, but there's yet a day coming where these kind of images that, that Isaiah would use point to the fulfillment of the promise laid so early in the story of the Hebrew Bible, that though mankind doesn't know his place and descends quickly from Eden to Sodom and Gomorrah, God isn't done. God is at work. God will heal. God will restore. God will neuter the serpent and his servant will lead to that perfect place of peace that he promises. And so that's a way too fast blast through the book of Isaiah. What's your homework? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read Isaiah. Um, Everybody on Zoom, read your Bible. That's it. <laughs> uh, thoughts, comments, questions? About 655, we have a couple minutes. You know, <clears throat> I've always heard that they said that he was so, you could look, he was so bad looking, you didn't want to look at him. You think that was after he was um, beaten and everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually where we think that he's just the, the ordeal that he went through prior to his crucifixion was he was brutalized. Yeah. Now, there's other scriptures that say there was nothing noteworthy about him. There was nothing that you would, you know, it's like again, Saul's the head taller and he's the perfect king. You don't, people didn't see in Jesus the perfect specimen of whatever. He was a regularly Looking Jewish man living a, a pretty ordinary life. Um, but I think that particular passage we read a minute ago is more about his pre crucifixion suffering. Right, well, let me pray for us and we will call it a night. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight for your grace extended to us perfectly through your son Jesus. We thank you for the fact that throughout your word you give us these these hints of the promises you will fulfill and the way, even the unexpected way you promise to bring about your kingdom and your will. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus who in him we see the fulfillment of, of that suffering servant of Isaiah who was despised and rejected, who on whom you laid the sins of the world because we all are like sheep who have gone astray. Thank you for the forgiveness that's found in him. Thank you for the hope that we have, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of difficulty. May we be people who, who take to heart the call 
of prophets like Isaiah to trust in you, no matter the circumstances, and to trust that you are able, even against impossible odds, to heal, to deliver, to comfort, and to sustain. Lord, I pray as we leave tonight, you would be with us the rest of this week as well. You would place us in circumstances and give us opportunities to share that very hope we've talked about tonight we have in Jesus. Give us boldness and awareness of the needs of those around us. And use us, we pray, for your kingdom's sake, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.